expected us to get to, but I think it, un, it underserves us to think that, that we're at a success metric right now because I think the success... We will leave this discussion here. You can see all of our coverage of the American Business Editors and Writers Conference in the C-SPAN video library. Go to cspan.org. Live now to the U.S. Senate, lawmakers today will begin with general speeches. At 11.30, they'll consider a judicial nomination with a vote on that set for noon Eastern. The Senate will then recess for their weekly party lunches from 12.30 to 2.15 p.m. Eastern. And when they return, they could take up gun control legislation. And now live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order and the chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Dr. Black. Let us pray. Lord of all, thank you for being America's strong defense across the seasons of its existence. Thank you also for your forgiving grace that restores us in spite of our mistakes and failures. Today, give our senators a renewed sense of your purpose so that they will stay within the circle of your will. May they discharge their duties with the joyful focus of living worthy of your great name. Lord, help them to trust you, to care for our nation, to look to you for guidance, and to remember that nothing can separate us from your love. We pray in your sacred name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Majority Leader. I now move to proceed to count number 32S649. Clerk will report. Motion to proceed to calendar number 32, S649, a bill to ensure that all Americans who should be prohibited from buying a firearm are listed in the National Instant Criminal Background Check System and so forth and for other purposes. Mr. President, the time until 1130 today will be equally divided between the majority and the minority. Uh, the Democrats will control the first 30 minutes, Republicans the final 30 minutes. At 11.30, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the nomination of Patty Schwartz to be a circuit judge for the Third Circuit. At noon, there will be a roll call vote on her nomination. The Senate will then recess from 12.30 until 2.15 to allow for our weekly caucus meetings. Mr. President, I would first uh, extend my congratulations to Senator McConnell and Louisville Cardinals for their uh, successful NCAA championship. It was a uh, Remarkable how they were always coming from behind to wind up winning. Uh, they did it with not offense, but with defense. I was very, very uh, impressed with the team, but most of all, impressed with their coach, Rick Pitino. Uh, but Rick Pitino on yesterday was also selected with Jerry Tarkanian to be members of the United the, uh, Basketball Hall of Fame. And certainly they deserve that, both of them. I would say, um, Mr. President, that um, in addition to congratulating my friend, Senator McConnell, also it's important to recognize my Deputy Chief of Staff, David McCallum, who is a rabid Louisville fan. And when I went down to participate in a program that Senator McConnell set up, I um, took David McCallum with me, and he loves those Louisville Cardinals. And uh, today he has uh, more reason to like them. And tonight, even more reason, because in the 
championship game tonight. We have the University of Connecticut playing the Louisville Cardinals the, for the women's championship. So, Mr. President, very uh, uh, mindful of uh, how strongly Senator McConnell feels about his Louisville Cardinals, and I'm not going to get into the. You, yeah, I'm, I just want to say I'm not getting into the politics of sports and. Uh, Kentucky, because I don't understand them, but I do know how much you care about the Louisville Cardinals. <laughs> Mr. Pratt, I just say to my good friend from Nevada, one of the things we enjoy talking about is sports, and he's a big UNLV fan as well. And I would just report uh, to my friend through the chair that it was a fun evening, uh, absolutely exciting to be there. And um, I was also grateful to you to, for coming down to the uh, University of Louisville a few years ago. And uh, it, it was, um, I, I was glad I had a chance to be there and to see it in person. Uh, you know, basketball in a football facility is a little odd. I mean, 75,000 people there. I'm not sure any people up in the top even saw, saw the players. Yeah, but um, we were uh, a little closer to the floor, and it was a, a wonderful experience. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Mr. President, I mentioned that the Hall of Fame, Basketball Hall of Fame, Jerry Tarkanian made it into the Hall of Fame. 20 years too late, but he made it. Why didn't he get in earlier? Because this courageous man took on the NCAA, which has absolute control over college athletes. And I would hope that as the years go by, that we as a Congress will take a look at that more closely. But I don't want to move away from the important day it is in Jerry Tarkanian's life. Jerry's now over 80. Didn't, doesn't get around like he used to, doesn't chew on the towels like he's famous for. But here's a man who was held out of the uh, Hall of Fame for far too long. This man won 990 games as a coach. Uh, he had more than an 80% winning record. Uh, a very fine, fine uh, man with a good family. His wife is a member of the Las Vegas City Council. Um, he brought such excitement to Las Vegas. Uh, he coached the um, running Rebels into four Final Fours, won the championship once, and but for some politics within the university system, he would probably still be coaching there. But uh, some things came up that he no longer was able to coach at UNLV, but I admire him as a person and certainly send my uh, congratulations to all those Run Rebel fans today because we have something to celebrate. But remember, and finally, he took in the NCA and he won. He won a large money judgment against them as a result of how they treated him. It was so unfairly and his players. There are people throughout the um, state of Nevada who played for him who are now uh, successful business people. They're teaching professions around the state. They're just doing all kinds of good things in the state and around the country because of Jerry Tarkinian. And the team that he had, mainly his wife, she was so good with those young men that came to UNLV. She was, a, among other things, a speech therapist. She understood uh, these young men and they cared about her as much as they did about Jerry. Mr. President, like most Americans, I believe the Second Amendment guarantees the right to bear arms. As a young boy, 12 years old, it was my birthday, I got a gun, but it wasn't some little pea shooter. It was a blunderbuss, a 12-gauge shotgun, bold action. Boy, oh, that's a big gun. I still have it. I've had it reblued and had the stock reworked. It's a beautiful gun. My parents sent away it for Sears for that catalog, for, in the Sears catalog for that present for me. That gun was a real extravagance for them. It cost $28, but oh, did I have fun with that great big gun that was bigger than me. And it kicked so much then, but I could handle it, but uh, didn't get to shoot it a lot. Those shotgun shells were expensive. But, Mr. President, like most Americans, I also believe the right to bear arms must be balanced with the right of all little boys and girls in this country, whether they live in inner city Chicago or sleepy, sleepy Newtown, Connecticut, to grow up safe from the threat of gun violence. Most gun owners are good. The vast, vast majority of gun owners are good, responsible people who love target shooting and hunting, want to protect their homes and their families. 
But, Mr. President, we have a responsibility to do everything in our power to keep guns out of the hands of convicted criminals and those who suffer from mental illnesses to make them a danger to themselves and to others. And we understand that now more than ever with the terrible slaughters at Aurora, Colorado, and Newtown, Connecticut. We have a responsibility as a body to safeguard our most vulnerable and most precious resource, our kids, our children, our babies. And the terrible tragedy at Newtown was a wake-up call. Uh, Mr. President, we're, we are really failing. We need to do more. Newtown, Newtown will always remember those little boys and girls. Some of them shot multiple times. Little children, five-year-old kids, six-year-old children. Now, the name, they're just names to us. But the people in Newtown, Olivia isn't just a name. Olivia is a little girl that had family that loved her. And they knew it's a little town, relatively speaking. Uh, Noah, Jack. We have a responsibility to safeguard these little kids. And unless we do something more than what's the law today, we have failed. It's long past time for a thoughtful examination of the lax laws and culture of violence that put Newtown and Aurora, Oak Creek, and Carson City, that's Carson City, Nevada, on the map for such a devastating reason. I only hope my Republican colleagues will allow us to have that conversation. Mr. President, I hope Republicans will stop trying to shut down debate, start engaging on the tough issues we were sent to Washington to tackle. Mr. President, there has been a hue and cry in this body for the two years plus the months of this Congress. People saying, let's have regular order, regular order. Let's have amendments. So I was relatively kind of stunned when I got a letter during our break from 13 Republican senators. They're the same senators who yell and scream the most about regular order and amendments. But in this letter to me, short, direct to the point, saying you're going to have no ability to go to the gun legislation, because we're going to stop it. We don't think there should be a discussion, a debate on guns. Now, Mr. President, how would I describe these 13 senators who sent me this letter? I want to do this respectfully, because they have a right to their opinions, even if they're illogical, and even if they're speaking out of both sides of their mouth. What does that mean, speaking out of both sides of their mouth? It's very, very succinct what it means. It means that, and it's described as a verb, looking up on the internet, to say different things to different people about the same subject. That's what they've done. They have been yelling and screaming, we want regular order. The other night when we were doing the, the uh, budget, it went on until 5 o'clock in the morning, one of the senators signed the letter, stood and said, we want to offer all the amendments we want to offer you. No one has a right to stop us on offering amendments. So that's what we did. But today, he feels differently. Today, he is speaking out of both sides of his mouth, saying different things to different people on the same subject. Mr. President, a former Republican congressman in Florida is now a talk show host, and he's very popular. He has a program called Morning Joe. Here's what Morning Joe has reported as having said. Scarborough tears into GOP filibuster on gun bill and says, and I quote, is anybody awake in my party? End of quote. quote. Here's what he said. With 92% of Americans supporting background checks, Scarborough noted, it's really hard to figure out what the political calculation is. It's a 90-10 issue that involves a massacre of 20 children. Is anybody awake in my party on the Hill? That's what Congressman Joe Scarborough said. 
As President Obama has said, it's impossible to prevent every senseless tragedy, but we owe it to our children to at least try. This President's only common sense that felons who sh couldn't pass a background check in a gun store should be able to walk into a gun show and buy a deadly weapon. This is not hyperbole. 40% of the guns sold in the United States each year, include, including many used to commit crimes, are sold legally at gun shows or through private sales without even the most basic background check. Three years ago, one of those guns, a shotgun, purchased legally without a background check during a 2008 gun show in Kingman, Arizona, about 90 miles from Las Vegas, was used to devastate the largest courthouse we have in Nevada, brand new Lloyd D. George Federal Courthouse in Las Vegas. And it happened just as prospective jurors were arriving for the day. This man walked in and started shooting. He blasted every place that, that only a shotgun can do. He killed Stanley Cooper of Sandy Valley, who was a security guard. He was killed instantly. This hail of buckshot going around the courthouse. He ran after his gun became empty to reload. Um, and it was, he was eventually killed. That, that is the man that caused all this carnage. He, but Stanley Cooper, this good man who was there, left behind a brother, four sons, a daughter, seven grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. He loved to spend time with his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. He loved horses and spending time outdoors. That's why he lived in Sandy Valley. He was no stranger to guns. He would spent 26 years serving his community as a Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Officer. The man who shot him, on the other hand, was a convicted felon with no right to carry a firearm. He certainly couldn't have passed a criminal background check, but the shooter never had to get one. He just went to one of these gun shows and bought this shotgun. Same basic shotgun that I got when I was a 12-year-old. Requiring a simple background check every time a gun is sold is common sense. Mr. President, as a brand new member of the Nevada State Legislature, I was a kid. But Sheriff Lamb, who was Sheriff of Clark County at the time, and now they have a TV program on him, uh, Dennis Quaid is playing Ralph Lamb, uh, he came to me and he said, uh, I need to do something because uh, we, have, we need people to wait a little while before they purchase a handgun. And we, I went to the legislature, not really understanding the process totally, but I introduced legislation that passed and became the law. That in Nevada, if you purchase a handgun, you have to wait three days to pick it up. And it's believed that alone has saved the lives of many people. Sometimes people in a fit of passion will purchase a handgun to do bad things with it. Mr. President, even as my dad did, kill themselves. Waiting a few days helps. Requiring a simple background check every time a gun is sold is common sense. Now, we're not asking for a three-day waiting period. It's, we have technology now that doesn't take that long. But, Mr. President, it's common sense. That's why more than 90% of Americans, including the vast majority of gun owners, the majority of people who belong to the NRA, support our proposal to keep guns out of the hands of criminals and those with mental illnesses. That's what universal background check, that's what it's all about. This legislation would also crack down on anyone who buys a gun as part of a scheme to funnel it to criminals, reducing violent crime and correcting police officers. The three things that are in the bill that's now before this body, all were reported out of the Judiciary Committee led by Pat Leahy. Now, if anyone thinks that Pat Leahy is a wimp on guns, they've got another thought coming. He's from the state of Vermont. He boasts about a gun he has. He has a 50 caliber gun. I don't know why he wants one, but he's got one. He is a man who loves to shoot his guns. So it, this bill is reported out of the Judiciary Committee, led by one of the people who uh, 
knows about as much about guns as many people in this body and, and more, I would, should say. This bill that came out of that committee gives schools across the country the resources to improve security and keep kids safe. It's called school safety. It's got federal trafficking in it. This legislation won't prevent every crime, especially those awful crimes. And background checks won't keep guns out of the hands of every violent madman. And we all know that. But we owe it to the American people to act as if there's a chance to save even one life, whether that life belongs to great-grandfather like Stanley Cooper or these babies who barely began to live in Newtown, Connecticut. Mr. President, they deserve a vote. Mr. President, the Republican leader. I'm going to take another opportunity uh, to congratulate the Louisville Cardinals for an incredible championship win last night. It was a truly exciting game, and I know my colleagues from Michigan take great pride in the fact that not just one, but two of their schools were in the Sweet 16. But you know, we Americans, we really love a story about somebody getting knocked down and picking themselves up again. That's why it was such a great moment to see Kevin Ware uh, cut the net last night. They had to lower the rim uh, a bit, as I'm sure it's difficult to climb a ladder with a cast on your right leg. But let me just say to him and to the entire University of Louisville, my undergraduate alma mater, well done. You've really made our state proud. Now today, Mr. President, I'd plan to talk about the President's budget, but first I also want to say a word about Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher was one of the most transformative political figures of the 20th century. She was a revolutionary, really a tireless tribune for what she called popular capitalism, her crusade to enfranchise the many. Thatcher's methods were razor-sharp wit and the force of her will, which had toughened through decades of literally plowing through obstacles. A woman of humble beginnings, she charged headfirst against a cross-partisan ruling class that had become calcified in office, an elite clique that had grown impotent in the face of the sort of post-war economic challenges that have long since drained the vitality from Western democracies that never had a leader like her. The starched dukes and faceless union men who traditionally alternated the reins of British power sneered at that woman, as they called her. The grocer's daughter, who knew nothing of their ways, whose middle-class instincts were unsuited to the business of governing. And yet she outmaneuvered them all. When Margaret Thatcher finally wrested the keys of office from those who had made peace with Britain's decline in a way she never could and never would, she set in motion a whirlwind of reforms. None of those were easy. The vested interest opposed her every move but in the teeth of fierce opposition, she ignited what could best be described as a political and economic earthquake, one with a tide of global reverberations. The kind of policies and ideas she inspired saw dictatorships and entrenched bureaucracies come crashing down, grinding poverty lose its grip, and the fossils of socialism recede into the surf. And in the wake of this wave of reform stood freer people with a greater say over their own lives and a greater hope for the future. That, Mr. President, is Margaret Thatcher's legacy. And in some ways, the parallels to our own day are hard to escape. When Margaret Thatcher took office, Britain was gripped by wrenching economic turmoil turmoil of a somewhat different kind than, but not entirely dissimilar to our own. 
but through unbending confidence in the power of free markets and in the power of free people to order their lives more intelligently than centralized elites, she literally turned the tide. And so we mourn her passing. But we still have much to learn from her courage and example. Because in the years ahead, we'll need to draw from it as conservatives look to turn the tide here in the U.S. and to set about a renewal of our own. Now, on another matter, tomorrow the President is set to unveil his budget, the details of his plan for America's future. Is it going to be a visionary blueprint that focuses on growing the economy instead of the government? A budget that can help rather than continue to hurt job creation? Is it going to be a budget that balances 10 years from now, 20 years from now, ever? Is it going to be a reformist document that makes bold choices? Will he finally drop the tax hike fanaticism that's frankly starting to enter the realm of the absurd? Well, from what we've heard so far, the prospects don't look all that great. We hear that the Senate Democratic budget, just like the Senate Democratic budget, it will never balance, ever. We hear it contains only about $600 billion or less in deficit savings over 10 years, which is roughly the level of the deficit in the first six months of this fiscal year. We hear it contains new spending proposals and does little to address the drivers of our debt. We hear it contains a tax hike upon tax hike upon tax hike. And in fact, all of the deficit reduction I just mentioned would be derived from myriad tax increases rather than spending reductions. So apart from reports of a modest entitlement change, and we'll need to see the details on that, it sounds like the White House just tossed last year's budget in the microwave. Look, this budget is already two months late, so I sincerely hope that it is not the case, that it's just a, a warmed over version of last year. Because if it is, what a colossal waste of time and what a disappointment. The American people really deserve a lot better than that. In a statement released yesterday, President Obama said Margaret Thatcher taught us that we are not simply carried along by the currents of history, that we can shape them with moral conviction, unyielding courage, and iron will. Well, what I'm saying this morning is that this is your moment to do just that, Mr. President, your moment. Lady Thatcher did not save her country from the abyss by taking half measures or tiptoeing around special interest groups. She pushed through groundbreaking reform after groundbreaking reform, usually under heavy fire from all sides and often over the objections of powerful leaders in her own party and cabinet. Had she governed by opinion poll, I'm sure she would have been a lot more popular while in office. And Britain would have never recovered from the abysmal state in which she found it. So, Mr. President, if you are ready to embrace bold reform, to take the steps that are needed to make our entitlement programs permanently solvent and grow the economy, then Republicans are ready to work with you. Because the time for pretending America's challenges can be solved with more of the same is over. Over. The time has come to summon the political courage to move beyond the status quo, to put the tax hikes and the poll-tested gimmicks aside, and to do, finally, what must be done. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the time until 11.30 a.m. will be equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees with senators permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each, with the majority controlling the first 30 minutes and the Republicans controlling the second 30 minutes. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Seyahat. Well, the Senate gaveled in about half an hour ago, and today, beginning with general speeches, coming up in about an hour, they'll consider a judicial nomination. A vote on that is set for noon Eastern today. Senators will recess for the weekly party lunches. That'll happen between 12.30 and 2.15 Eastern. We could also see them this afternoon take up gun control legislation. As the Senate continues in this quorum call, we'll go live now to Capitol Hill as the Senate Finance Committee he he uh, is holding a hearing this morning for the nomination of Marilyn Tavener to be administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. 14. And that makes it personal for a lot of us. And it underscores the fact that what we do at CMS directly affects the lives of so many. I've been fortunate in my career path that it has given me a variety of perspectives on health care that I believe uniquely position me to lead CMS. I do have a clinical background from my early days as a staff nurse, a business perspective from my days as a hospital CEO and division president, and a government perspective both from my work as Virginia's Secretary of Health and also the previous three years at CMS. Simply put, CMS needs an administrator and they need one with strong operational skills. While it is very important to have a vision for the agency, we also have over $800 billion business to run that a large amount of the country has a stake in, from beneficiaries to providers, to hospitals, to insurance companies, to Congress, to this administration, to the American taxpayer, and to our CMS employees and contractors. Therefore, I consider it essential to my leadership role at CMS to be a partner with all of those stakeholders. And I view my relationship with this committee and with Congress as a whole as a partnership. I have personally met with most of the members of this committee, and I have appreciated the opportunity to engage with all of you in an open dialogue. While we may not always share the same views, we have worked together to resolve challenges, and I'd like the chance to continue to do so. My management style centers a lot around listening, pragmatism, and consistently trying to do what's right, even though it may not be the quickest or easiest path. This style has led to many achievements over the last three years, and I highlighted some of those in my written testimony, and I will not go over those now. But in closing, I would like to share my vision and the three primary focuses that we have for moving the agency forward. The first one is we need to operate CMS as a business and act like business partners. This means having an open door policy to work together and listen to the concerns of all the groups that we are accountable with, those groups I listed earlier. Second, we have a large responsibility in the months ahead to implement key pieces of legislation to ensure all Americans have access to affordable health care coverage, whether it's through the health insurance marketplace, whether it's through Medicaid, CHIP, Original Medicare, or Medicare Advantage. And last, we need to leverage the tools that you all have granted us to both reduce overall cost of care and improve the health care delivery system. These tools include new payment strategies connected to performance, innovative new models of care, and enhanced tools to combat fraud. Lastly, I would like to thank this committee and the staff for the respect and the working relationships we've built over the last several years. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator Hatch, for holding this hearing and giving me the opportunity to speak before the committee and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tavener. Um, I'd like to uh, ask you a few questions about the Medicare secondary payment rule. And I mention this because um, uh, in Montana, in Libby, Montana, but um, once I was visiting there about 10 years ago, I met a group of folks there who are suffering from um, asbestos-related diseases, especially mesothelioma, and um, a large percentage of that town, unfortunately, has, has passed away uh, because of the asbestos produced by 
the company W.R. Grace, that asbestos has affected people in, that, in Libby, Montana, as well as around the country, uh, because asbestos is found in lots of insulation products. But when I visited then, uh, one fellow there named Les Scramstead very much impressed me. We met earlier, and I told you about Les, and I've, I found a photograph for you I want you to have. And um, uh, Les said to me, We're gonna be, I'm going to be watching you, Senator. A lot of people said they'd help us, but they haven't. Um, and I knew Les meant it, and I knew, you didn't have to say that because every once in a while you come across a situation where you're going to do whatever it takes to solve it. This was that, and uh, that is make sure that people in Libby, Montana, have to get justice. Anyway, I got a photo. There's, there's Les. Les has passed away, um, died of, of mesothelioma. He, uh, when he came home from the mine, caked with dust, he braced his wife. His wife has a disease now, too. Um, his kids would jump in his lap. One of his children has now died because of mesothelioma. And I want to go through all the ins and outs of, of health care treatment um, at Libby. It's also one of the largest Superfund sites in the country. Um, and it's very similar to um, that book, that movie, Civil Action, in Woburn, Massachusetts. The company then was as W.R. Grace. It's the same company here, frankly. And um, the point is this, that many people, um, well, the, the administration very correctly declared a national health care emergency for the people in Libby. That meant that people uh, received Medicare payments. Even though they're not 65, they get to Medicare. But as you know, under the Medicare secondary payment rule, if there's a settlement as between folks in Libby and, and the company, that uh, payments cannot be made pursuant to that settlement until Medicare uh, uh, determines what costs, if any, um, uh, the, uh, the person um, has to make back to, to Medicare to so that the, uh, the settlement dollars can be paid. There are many people, and Libby have waited up to a year. There's one instance where a, a, a woman was waiting, meanwhile her husband died, and finally, a year later, uh, as, as, as CMS made a determination under the secondary payment rule, and, uh, <clears throat> but uh, even by then, she had died. But when the determination was made after she died, it turned out she, that there, there was no uh, reimbursement necessary from her to, um, uh, to CMS. So there are a lot of people caught in this situation. There have been so many levels of injustice in Libby, Montana, but this is one of them. It's the delays in the secondary payment rule. And if, I'd deeply appreciate it if you could uh, tell me what you're going to do to speed up the process so that people there who have you know, suffered from asbestos-related uh, diseases are going to get um, some medical, medical care. Chairman Baucus, let me start by, first of all, thanking you on behalf of, of the residents of Libby. I, the, the work there has been amazing, and when I first came to CMS, um, it was being done through HRSA, and then obviously you, we were able to get coverage through the Medicare program, and we've seen so many families benefit from the program. So first of all, I want to personally thank you for that. But second, the Medicare secondary payer has also been a program that I've been intimately involved with over the last several months. We had some performance issues. I think we've corrected those both with staff that we've brought on and with contractors that, that, that we work with. But more specific to your question, we did have a large number of cases that were that needed to be resolved, that needed to be moved through the system so that people could understand what they were eligible for. I think by the end of this month we will have completed um, at least a hundred individual cases that I'm aware of. There's also another large group that's moving through in a, in a large settlement. So I think we will have done a, a good job of eliminating most of the backlog. And you've got my commitment that I'll stay on top of it going forward. I appreciate it very much. Um, I neglected to ask you four obligatory questions, but I'll ask you before I turn it over to Senator Hatch. Is there anything you're aware of in your background that might present a conflict of interest with the duties of the office to which you have been nominated? Uh, and there are not anything I'm aware of. I have signed recusals in two areas, and so I want to make the committee aware of those. Uh, the first area has to do with my, as you heard, I worked a long time for the Hospital Corporation of America. So I volunteered and asked for a recusal there, um, which in matters, certain matters that are specific to HCA. Uh, but that was one that I initiated with our ethics department. The second one is with the state of Virginia. 
And although I had completed my time with um, the Secretary of Health position, that I could have participated in matters. Uh, my husband works with the legislative division within the state, so I have recused myself from specific matters with the state of Virginia. You know, you're going to do a good job. You're the first witness who's answered that question without, uh, without just saying no, that is, you explained it. <laughs> That's never happened before. <laughs> yeah, and, and Senator Grassley has been chairman of this committee many years, just now said he can verify that. <laughs> You're an impressive lady. <laughs> Second, we'll see what you do with this one. <laughs> you can only go downhill from here. <laughs> yeah. Do you know of any reason, personal or otherwise, that would in any way prevent you from fully and honorably discharging the responsibilities of the office to which you have been nominated? I do not. Do you agree without reservation to respond to any reasonable summons to appear and testify before any duly constituted committee of Congress if you are confirmed? Yes, sir. Good. One more. Do you commit to provide a prompt response in writing to any questions addressed to you by any senator of this committee? And answer it fully in the first letter back. <laughs> I will do my best, and I know I have some areas of improvement there. Okay. Thanks very much, Sir, sir Hatch. Well, if you do, you'll be one of the first ones in that recent time. All I can say, we hope you will, because this committee takes these responsibilities really, really seriously. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the work that you've done through the years. Uh, I'm really pleased with the effort that you're putting forth at CMS and how important it is to you and how you value that agency even though it's a very, very difficult agency to administer. Let me ask you just a couple of specific questions. The CBO recently estimated that 7 million people will, will enroll in the exchanges, which is 1 million lower than what, uh, uh, than, than what CBO, CBO estimated at the time the law was being debated. Now, how much will the exchange user fees go up if enrollment targets are not met and what is the lowest target enrollment that CMS anticipated when doing budget projections and will cause the agency to raise the user fees if the enrollment tar targets are not met? That is a great question. Senator Hatch, we, we have actually followed the CBO's guidelines, and so we are using the same estimate as the CBO, and our user fee was actually predicated on that number. And uh, when we were going through rulemaking, we, we had extensive discussion. So I think we believe that that number is appropriate and the user fee would cover that type of number. Okay. Uh, details on the implementation of Title I of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act have been lacking, as you know, especially uh, as it relates to the establishment of exchanges and efforts to educate consumers about enrollment. Now, could you commit to providing a bi-weekly update on the establishment of exchanges and enrollment, including milestones, deadlines, and progress reports? Yes, sir. I think we have, in it, we have submitted some early work, but I certainly think at this point, you know, we're kind of going through four phases if, with the exchanges, and I think we're now entering the part where consumer outreach and education is becoming more important. So I think we'll be able to give you biweekly updates. We'd like to have that because it's something that we, we're really concerned about, and we want to make sure that we're on top of it as well. In public speeches, you have said that the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act has some of the strongest health care anti-fraud provisions in American history. Now, you mentioned in your testimony that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the agency you're going to supervise, along with its partners, recovered a record $4.2 billion last fiscal year from individuals who tried to defraud uh, the federal health care programs. Now, I think that's an impressive number. But I'm interested in what CMS specifically did to contribute to that number and how much of it is attributable to CMS. And during your time at CMS, which PPACA provisions, uh, 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 while you've served there, what, what uh, affordable health care provisions has CMS used to reduce fraud? And can you provide quantifiable results for the C CMS specific actions undertaken? Now, even though that $4.2 billion sounds like a lot, we know there's a lot more fraud than that. Right. And we know that we ha we're just beginning to really go after uh, those who are defrauding our taxpayers. 
But if you could answer that for me. I will. I will try to talk a little bit about how we've looked. Uh, you're right, the Affordable Care Act gave us several tools to work with. and. So we have kind of uh, gone through an implementation period. I would say we started first with the work that was done around providers, making sure we had legitimate providers in the system. And some of our early uh, proposed and final rules dealt with that. And also assigning categories of risk to those providers, because I think not only did we have a system that was probably a bit outdated, but it didn't sign varying degrees of risk based on what we knew to be facts. Um, so we've done that. So if you're in a, a moderate or a high risk category, you're going to have on-site visits. There are going to be a lot more things because we believe whatever we can do to preempt fraud on the front end versus this pay and chase, which the 4.2 billion is a great number and I'm proud of that number, but that's also what we want to prevent on the first, in the first place. So that was the first thing. The second area that we went uh, after, if you will, was the prepayment or our, our authorizations on the Affordable Care Act gave us the ability to withhold payment in the event of something suspicious. So we started doing that. Uh, the third area, which we're now approaching, will be how we look at the moratorium. You all gave us the ability in the act to actually impose moratoriums on certain providers. So we're starting to look at that as kind of the third natural stage. There's also work in the Small Business Act that was done around predictive modeling. And uh, we've had that up and running, and we've submitted our, our first report to Congress, but we have more work to do in that area. So there are a lot of different tools, but I think our goal, uh, our absolute primary goal, is let's stop it before it happens. Because once we are in the situation where the money has already been paid out, we have great working relationships with the OIG and with DOJ, but it's much more difficult after the fact. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your willing to serve. Thank you, um, Senator, Senator Menendez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Tavener, congratulations on your nomination again. And Thanks. as we discussed when we met, uh, I look forward to working with you in ways that we can address uh, reducing costs throughout Medicare and improving health care to the nation's seniors. And that includes moving past the SGR uh, and finding new ways to pay physicians for the efficient, coordinated, and quality delivery of health care. Uh, and utilizing methods that improve medication management, which has been shown to reduce unnecessary readmissions and provide significant savings and improve health outcomes, and including that includes using medications to the most efficient use, and coordinating care delivery across the spectrum, especially for special populations like dual Medicare and Medicaid eligible and those with severe disabilities so that both providers and patients are at the table to work together to improve health care. So as we work to fully implement health care reform, uh, we need to continue to look forward to new and innovative ways to reduce costs while improving care. And I appreciate some of the efforts you've already taken in that regard as the acting administrator. I have a specific question uh, with reference to one of the elements of the essential health benefits required of all plans uh, offered in the exchange or marketplace, which is coverage for behavioral health, uh, including therapies for autism. It is a provision that I had the support of this committee in including into the law. April is currently uh, uh, Autism Awareness Month, uh, and I'm hearing from families in New Jersey and throughout the nation, especially those in states without an existing autism benefit requirement, who are nervous that the rules regulating the essential health benefits will allow insurance companies to skirt this requirement by substituting benefit categories and offering actuarial equivalence benefits that in reality don't really cover these incredibly important services. So my question to you is what specific steps will you take to ensure the intent of this committee and of the law to ensure behavioral health benefits uh, especially those for autism and other developmental disabilities, are available in all qualified health plans. And that includes plans on federally facilitated exchanges and in states that lack existing state-level requirements. Thank you, Senator Menendez. And I also share your concerns about reducing costs and medication adherence, and, and we, we have some work um, underway in those areas, and I would love the opportunity to come sit talk to you about those. We'll look forward to that. 
Um, same is true with the, with the issue of essential health benefits. I, I think it would be helpful if I could come sit down in your office and walk through some of these concerns. I had not heard this specifically, so I'd like to get some more information from your staff and follow up with you. Well, we'd love to do that. I mean, it clearly was the intent of uh, myself as the author and the broad support we received in the committee and uh, obviously in the final version of the law. Uh, to have uh, the inclusion as part of the essential health benefits package, uh, the, the benefits for uh, um, behavioral health. And to begin to water down that would clearly violate the intention of what those of us who offered it. Finally, uh, in a New Jersey specific context, um, our governor has indicated that uh, he has no intention of doing anything to assist HHS uh, with the establishment of the New Jersey Health Insurance Exchange. There's not a state-based exchange. There's going to be a federal exchange. Since many of the consumer protections and insurance markets, uh, market reforms we instituted in health care reform require state regulators to enforce, I'm concerned that people living in states like New Jersey where the state government is uncooperative won't actually benefit from these protections. What uh, specific role will state insurance regulators have under a federally facilitated exchange and are you going to provide vigorous oversight uh, and reject state certification of exchange plans if they don't meet the standards for quality uh, required under the Affordable Care Act? That's a great question as well, Senator. In the cases, in most cases, um, states have continued to implement, if you remember there was uh, a certain section, if you will, of insurance reforms separate from the exchanges or the marketplace. And we've had great cooperation with states, with insurance commissioners. We've also had the ability to work with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. And uh, wherever possible, uh, in both in proposed rulemaking and in final rules, we've gotten their feedback. So what we are seeing inside states is they have very active rate review programs. We do have the authority under the statute to step in and supervise and, and have more rigorous oversight. And we may ultimately end up doing that in a couple of states, but right now states have been very much a part of that uh, process. In states where um, we are responsible for the exchange, we work with the issuers and with the state insurance office. The issuers will be submitting their plans. They'll go through a series of reviews first to make sure they <coughs> Set, if you will, all the 10 <coughs> essential categories, then to make sure that they are appropriate for services covered. So that process is actually underway even as we speak, and we handle that for any um, state that does not have a state-based exchange. Well, the time is up. I would love to get feedback from you as we move forward to this, this specific New Jersey exchange on how we are proceeding and whether we're getting the cooperation necessary. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, very much. Mr. Grassley. I too join my colleagues in welcoming you, more importantly, for the work you've done thus far, and hopefully you'll be able to continue. I particularly appreciated your coming to my office for some meetings, and I think uh, it reinforces uh, what Senator Kane said about you as you worked for him in that administration. Uh, I think you'd make a fine administrator, and I want to be able to support your confirmation. I have just one issue that, in the scheme of things that you deal with, might be a little issue that I want to bring up with you. It's something that maybe back in 2011, from another angle, I wrote to you about. I, I'm not, uh, uh, so I'd like to know how you would uh, deal with the problem that has recently come to my attention. On Monday, April 1, this year, 3.42 p.m., Height Security sent an advisory that told their clients of the CMS Medicare Advantage policy decision and that they supported related stocks. Um, the consequence of a political intelligence firm having access to this information 18 minutes before the market close is astonishing. In the 18 minutes remaining uh, trading minutes, on April 1, the volume of Humana, United Health Group, and Aetna stock was more than a half a billion dollars. Uh, more stock in those companies was traded in those 18 minutes and throughout the rest of the day. 
when information leaks from the administration that has the ability to cause significant market movement, it is wrong and quite possibly illegal. I sent a letter last Thursday formally seeking information from you, uh, and I hope you agree that ultimately you're responsible. What are you going to do to hold somebody accountable for this leak? Senator Grassley, let me start by saying I, too, have appreciated our meetings. And second, I do not consider this a small issue. I consider this a huge issue. Um, CMS takes all of this seriously, and, and we did receive your letter, and we have initiated um, an internal review. Um, and it will be extensive, and obviously we'll give you feedback from that review. But the second thing is I've also asked that the Office of the Inspector General be brought in on this issue as well, because we need a third impartial, if you will, uh, review of this. Um, CMS, I take a lot of pride in the staff at CMS, and this is not something that, that we want to happen ever, and so we will do a thorough investigation and we will give you feedback. Okay, and I thank you for inviting in the Inspector General, because I was going to ask you if you were going to do that, and you are. And I assume that that gives you uh, the authority uh, that your investigation uh, has to compel the production of information within C CMS. Would that be fair to conclude that the Inspector General can get all this information out? You don't have to worry about authority? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I'd be even more curious uh, what authority your investigation has to compel the production of information uh, beyond CMS at HHS, OMB, or the White House, and I assume that you're saying that that's the Inspector General's going to do that. I hope that if there's, if, uh, if it's found that other agencies are involved, he has the authority to get that information out. And I, I will follow up with that, Senator, because I don't want to give you incorrect information as to their authorities. Um, now, I obviously don't believe that you can get the folks at HHS or OMB or White House without some help, so if uh, I, I, I'm going to pursue this, so you inform them that if this is beyond CMS, uh, I expect action to be taken, and I'm going to get to the bottom of it one way or the other. Thank you very much, and, and I know you're very sincere in what you said, and uh, I'm going to be following up with the Inspector General as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Carper, you're next. Thanks very much. Welcome. Thank you for uh, your service uh, to date and for your willingness to continue to serve. Uh, one of the things that came to see us was uh, legislation called the FAST Act that Senator Coburn and I, joined by 36 of our colleagues in the last Congress, uh, introduced. Um, CMS was good enough, your department was good enough to adopt a number of those provisions without the legislation being passed. We'll be reintroducing the legislation. I would invite my colleagues to, uh, to join us in the idea that there's better health care results uh, for the same amount of money or less money and by going after some of the fraud that you all know exists and some of the waste and inefficiencies that exist. So uh, I, I want to uh, just uh, thank you for the, the cooperation we've, uh, we've, we've uh, experienced thus far and invite the continued participation of, of your staff to help make the legislation better and tell us what we need to do to enable you to do your jobs better on, on that, uh, on that uh, uh, front. I, uh, I also uh, want to mention uh, an issue called improper payments. Uh, a lot of people think improper payments are the same as fraud. They are not. Improper payments are mistakes. Uh, they are uh, accounting mistakes, financial mistakes. They're just human mistakes, and they add up to a lot of money, as we know. In 2002, we passed legislation signed by former President Bush that said agencies start to have they must begin reporting improper payments. In 2010, uh, Senator Coburn and I uh, introduced legislation adopted signed by President Obama that said not only do they have to report uh, improper payments, they have to stop making them and they have to uh, begin to try to go out and recover money that's been uh, improperly paid and that we're going to hold accountable the folks through running those agencies to make sure that they're uh, adhering to the law. We have seen, I think, in the last two, maybe three years now, improper payments, even though almost every agency is now reporting them, the number of improper, the amount of improper payments actually dropping, uh, which is a very, very good thing. So even though the amount of uh, improper payments being reported has gone up, the number of improper payments has gone down, which is a, very, a real positive. Uh, talk to us about uh, your efforts 
to, uh, to continue to drive down improper payments, not ju just do this uh, pay and chase where we actually pay a bill, a medical bill, and then find that it was wrong, and then we try to run the money down, but while you're doing it, the front end of the, of the, uh, of the, the, the situation to stop the improper payments. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carr. Uh, obviously, one of the first things we do has to do, has to do with training and education, uh, not only for physicians and hospitals, but also for uh, their staffs and, and the individuals they work with. So we spend a great deal of time on the, what I'll call the training and education piece on the front end. Uh, the second thing that we do in some areas where we've seen consistent if you will, um, and you're right, it, it, it's not fraud in the terms of fraud, it's, it's documentation difficulties, it's, it's failure to submit the required documentation, it's review of documentation after the fact. Uh, one area where we had a tremendous amount of problems had to do with power mobility devices, the, the power wheelchairs. And so we implemented a pilot in, in a prior authorization mode, which is somewhat more like private insurance tends to do anything. So now, since September of last year, individuals who need power wheelchairs, there's actually a prior authorization process. Um, what we've seen happen there is it's controlled some of the abuse and also uh, beneficiaries are still able to get their wheelchairs within short periods of time. We have a 10-day uh, threshold that we hold ourselves to to get this reviewed and turned around and out. So it's those kind of models, I think, that help more on the front end. We are seeing a reduction in improper payment, which is encouraging, but we also are looking at are there other areas we need to look at? Are there things inside lab? Are things inside DME that we can do on the front end? Obviously, some of the work around competitive bidding and DME had to do with some of the prevention on the front end. So we're open to new ideas. We enjoy working with you and your staff and uh, supporting you. All right, thanks. Thanks very much. I, I have here some, some numbers I, we might find interesting. Improper payments, uh, 2010, uh, $121 billion, billion dollars, $121. Uh, uh, 2011 down to 115 billion, still a lot of money. 2012 down to 108 billion dollars, and we've seen uh, drops in Medicaid and proper payments, several billion dollars. Medicare numbers are actually flat uh, across those uh, those years, and we want to do better in in that regard. Last thing, I, I spent uh, some time this uh, last week in uh, Minnesota and visited uh, Mayo, visited uh, uh, United uh, uh, Health Group, and uh, one of the things we talked about were how do we move away from fee-for-service, how do we better uh, collaborate in delivery of, of, of health care, and the, the role that uh, Medicare Advantage may pay, play in, in, in that regard. Uh, previously, we've overpaid Medicare Advantage. I think we've corrected that. Just talk to us about the role you see Medicare Advantage playing in the next several years of moving away from fee-for-service, please. Thank you. Uh, I think that, you know, as, you, as you're well aware, the Medicare Advantage programs have grown and continue to grow, and we've had great uh, working relationships with some of their medical, uh, medical directors on this issue of how do we stop paying under a fee-for-service model? How do we look at whether it's uh, an accountable care organization, if it's some type of coordinated approach? Some of the folks that you talked about are leaders in that area, and so I think we're sharing ideas. Some of the ideas that, uh, some of the things we've learned in the innovation Center, they're adopting, we're adopting some of their ideas. Um, so I see that role continuing to grow. They are uh, great partners with us. Uh, the programs, beneficiaries like the programs, they do good quality reviews. So I see that partnership continuing. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, just get one, one last quick point. To, just to share with my Republican colleagues, uh, we've been a long time without a, a confirmed uh, a CMS uh, administrator. I think we've got a good one here. And, and I would just hope that we can um, get a report out of here, get her confirmed uh, uh, with, uh, with great dispatch. She's a good candidate, excellent candidate. We're lucky that she's willing to serve. Thank you. That's my plan. <laughs> Do it quickly. <laughs> Sir Ramsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that was an impressive uh, group of introductions, and I really appreciate uh, that you listed out the stakeholders in your, in your statement. I used to be in the shoe business, so I call those customers. And uh, that's, that's a great thing to have recognized. Uh, <clears throat> I am concerned about some recent reports that have identified some anti-competitive effects of excessive integration of hospital systems, including reductions in access and increases in cost for the consumer. Uh, what's CMS doing to ensure the incentives that it's building into the Medicare program uh, to better coordinate care or integrate services don't have an adverse effect on competition and the price of health care in the long run? 
Uh, and, and have you engaged the Department of Justice on this issue at all? Senator Renzi, thank you. Uh, th this is something that uh, we do work with the Department of Justice, and, but in a different way. When we tend to look at models through the Innovation Center, that tends to be where we are engaging the Department of Justice to make sure that we are not creating any anti-competitive work in the demonstration areas. I think engaging them more and, and having them be a partner is a good suggestion, and that's something that we could do. In your um, answers to some of the questions, you mentioned your uh, uh, involvement with HCA. This one is a, is a hospital issue, but I assume that your thing about it not being specifically about HCA precludes you from having to recuse yourself on that? Right. Okay. Um, now, the Society of Actuaries recently released a report in which they estimate that health insurance premiums in the individual market will increase 32 percent on the average nationally and in Wyoming specifically. The National Association of Insurance Commissioners released a paper just in the last week that outlined steps states can take to mitigate expected rate increases due to the health care law. In fact, the NAIC paper concludes that states, quote, should begin evaluating these and other strategies immediately in order to mitigate the rate increases when the major market reforms take effect in 2014. What's CMS doing to address the risks identified by that report and, and other reports? Senator Z, first I would say that we don't uh, agree completely with the actuary report, and, I, and I'll give you some reasons why. But I'll also remind this committee that while I have great respect for actuaries and work with them daily, these are estimates or predictions about things that we don't know for certain. And, and I'll take us back to Part D and some of the estimates around Part D that I think we ended up being like less than 40 percent of the uh, original estimates for the cost of Part D. So I would just caution us about uh, taking the word or, or the reports of actuaries as more than just estimates or speculation. But having said all that, there are some things in the Affordable Care Act that I think mitigate any type of insurance increases, and I'll, I'll try to talk about those. But I'll talk about them in three areas. The first area is when individuals talk about premium increases, I think they would have you believe that that's the entire insurance market. And I'll remind you that what the Affordable Care Act is dealing with is a small market or an individual market, so less than 20 million max. Uh, large employers are fairly exempt from the requirements, and large employers have seen the most modest increases in the last three years that they've seen in some time. So I think our overall strategy, both in government and in the private sector around controlling costs, is, is seeing some, bearing some fruit. Um, the second issue, in addition to the size of the market, it does not take into account those uh, pieces of the Affordable Care Act that actually work to decrease. Um, first of all, there's the issue of the tax credit, which is obviously applied to the premium. Second, there's variety in plans, so you can have a bronze or a silver or platinum plan, which changes it. Third, there's the availability of catastrophic coverage for individuals up to 30. Fourth, there's the issue of dependent coverage, where, where thanks to you all and the work in the law, we are covering individuals up to the age of 26. And I could go on. There are issues around reinsurance. If you remember, you put $10 billion into a reinsurance pool for the next three years with the idea of mitigating any type of premium increases. The rate bans that we have, there's a long list. And I, and I won't bore you with the entire list, although I'm happy to give it to you. We have it. Uh, the third area that I would say is a reminder to folks, and I think we saw this um, in the Time Magazine article, insurance is not necessarily insurance, as we all tend to think of it, having worked for large employers and having pretty robust insurance policies. Some of these, if you will, um, low-cost premiums were low-cost for a reason. They didn't really... Uh, offer robust insurance, as many folks found out the first time they had to be hospitalized or they were diagnosed with cancer or another disease that required a lot of treatment. So, as you can tell, I feel pretty strongly about this, but I would not agree with the actuary assumptions. My time's expired, but I'll have some specific follow-up questions Great. as the you. accountant and uh, uh, also some other questions that I hope you'll answer. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator.
Uh, sir Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mrs. Tavenow, I also want to thank you for your public service and thank your family for their willingness to serve because it's a family effort and we appreciate that. In your statement, you point out that you have many stakeholders, and that's true. But the most important stakeholders, as uh, Chairman Baucus has pointed out, taxpayers of this country and the families that depend upon the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, Medicare, Medicaid, and the CHIP program. So I want to talk about one aspect of that, which is pediatric uh, dental care. Uh, John Bloom, when he was before our committee, uh, the director of Medicare, said it would be a mistake to silo oral health care and treat it separately as we did once mental health care. But I'm worried that that's exactly how we're moving in treating pediatric dental care as a secondary issue, even though it's an essential health benefit. You pointed out in response to a, a letter from me that it's clear the standalone policies, Congress wanted that, uh, but that even though it's part of the essential health benefits, it's not a requirement for an individual to obtain uh, pediatric oral health coverage if the, their primary policy does not cover it, as it doesn't have to, and then they don't then it looks like have to take a standalone policy if they don't want to. Um, you've also gone through the deductions, and uh, you started with $1,000 in those plans uh, that you are uh, administering. Now you're talking about $700 as a separate deductible for uh, dental, oral health. And you cite as one of the reasons to me that uh, the cost issue, even though the Millman report reflects that the difference between $700 and $270 is less than $2 a month. So can you just assure me how you're going to implement the Affordable Care Act and make sure that pediatric dental care doesn't become a secondary coverage, that it is what Congress intended it to be as part of the essential health benefits, and how we are going to assure that all families have access to affordable pediatric dental care. We've made progress. Uh, I acknowledge that. But I am concerned that this could be some backsliding. Please assure me I'm not, my fears are, are going to be alleviated. Thank you, Senator Cardin. As you know from our conversations, I am very much supportive of pediatric dental. And, and obviously, you all have done a tremendous amount of work in the Medicaid program, and we've come a long way. And obviously, the tragedy in Maryland had a lot to do with that. But I, I hear you on this issue, and I will tell you that we will go back and take a look at it. We did mitigate some of the um, cost sharing, if you will, uh, at your recommendation. But on the coordination of the two, we may have more work to do, and I'm happy to take a look at it and, and work with you. But it, we'd have to do it in future rulemaking, so, because we are pretty far along right now, and that's the part I want to I understand that. Uh, I just urge you, Congress allowed you to have standalone policies, but I don't think we intended that families wouldn't have coverage. And now it looks like because of the combination that you are interpreting it as not being required, and the fact that you have high deductibles, meaning that families would have to make a decision, am I really going to reach $700 per child? Do I really want a policy? It looks like that many families will go without coverage, which is certainly not what Congress intended. And I would very much appreciate you following up on that. We will do. And I would like to come meet with you and look at this report as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also uh, contacted you about experience we had in our state with a private Medicare plan, Bravo Health Plan, that gave notice one week before the end of the open enrollment period uh, to a large number of, uh, that this plan in included a large number of people under a federally qualified plan in East Baltimore. Uh, where the individuals are of modest income, they, it's very difficult for them to travel. They don't have, many of them don't have automobiles, and it's, it's just difficult. It's a pretty closed community. And as a result of the decision to terminate, uh, they no longer have their primary care physician that they had once before. They've been giving, giving information that they have to travel a long distance in order to get to a primary care physician. And we asked for some uh, relaxation of the open enrollment period in order to deal with this hardship. Uh, so far, we haven't heard anything positive about this. Can you uh, look into this and per perhaps can. find a way in which we can provide uh, help to these individuals? Yeah, I will do that. Thank and you. I'll get back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator.
Um, um, on the list, I have several senators next in order, but I understand that um, that um, Senator Roberts wishes has a pressing engagement, and he's going to ask the indulgence of senators ahead of him. <laughs> but that's up to Senator Roberts as well as the senators ahead of him. <laughs> Um, uh, I'll just Mr. Say Chairman, on, on may I list. proceed? I have Senator Isaacson is next, and Senator Portman following Senator Bennett. I have not asked uh, Senator Isaacson if that would be possible. I do have uh, permission uh, from my friend and colleague, uh, Senator Portman, however, but I would ask uh, the Senator's indulgence. I will voluntarily indulge the Senator from Kansas. <laughs> Ms. Tanner, what do you want to be called? Do you want to be called Administrator? Madam Administrator? That doesn't sound very... I actually prefer Marilyn. Marilyn. <laughs> I've, got a, um, I've got a different name. Uh, our state motto is to the stars uh, through difficulty. I apply that to CMS. Uh, the farmers in Montana, for that matter, anywhere, uh, hope always springs eternal. They never put the seed in the ground unless they thought they were going to have a crop regardless of three years of drought. You have been endorsed by the Candace Hospital Association, the Candace Medical Society. Uh, you have the support of hospices, you have the support of ambulance drivers, you have the support of nurses and doctors, you have support of home health care, and the list goes on. All of our providers. There's a reason for that, and that's because of everything that's been said about you. So I think we're going to, I'm going to dub you at least uh, for Candace and in the Dodge City area as the new sheriff in town. And you're going to wear a white hat. And there's an awful lot of people in CMS who wear black hats. And that's just in the way that uh, the rural health care uh, delivery system has been treated. And it's most unfortunate. Uh, when you say CMS, uh, the line used by many of our providers is that uh, there's a new acronym. It's a mess. And that's not a very nice thing to be saying about an agency that's supposed to be helping folks, but that's the way it is. Now, you and I have talked about this. And I appreciate you coming in. And you've been through those, you know, through those chairs, which makes that exceedingly important. I express my concerns with the current regulatory process. We discussed the deviation from the uh, traditional regulatory process of notice and comment. The lack of stakeholder input, especially as it relates to shortened comment periods and through the use of something called sub-regulatory guidance, postings, email, bulletins, guidance, and something called FAQ, frequently asked questions. Unfortunately, nobody has any time to read this stuff uh, or to be aware of this until somebody that's been contracted out knocks on the hospital door with a fine. And that's not right. So during our discussions, you had mentioned that these are all issues that CMS is aware of and that you expect to be addressed. Specifically, I've received commitments. There would be no more IFRs, what we call the gotchas, uh, interim final rules, that stakeholders would be given more opportunity to uh, participate in the regulatory process by allowing a 60-day comment period like has you know, been done in the past. And then if enough suggestions have come in to tweak the proposed uh, reg or to change it, uh, you could have another 60 days and get it right. Uh, and that CMS would work with OMB to ensure the cost estimates included in the regulations are clear uh, so that all of our health care providers can know what to expect as it relates to the cost associated with the regulatory actions. And you agreed with me. And I agreed with you in regards to your commitment. Uh, but I was dismayed that following our most recent conversation, an IFR was issued to implement something called benefit and payment uh, parameters. You. Understanding that you are on a tight timeline, this is a completely unacceptable process, however. And I would hope that your previous commitments to return to the traditional notice and comment work uh, period, i.e. transparency, uh, make it such that CMS is not considered in the rural health care areas as welcome as a plague of locusts uh, that you would work with me and I think you said yes at that particular time. Uh, I hope that we, will could, uh, we could continue on that basis. I think the answer is yes and then I will yield back the balance of my time to Senator Portman or Senator Isaacson. Senator Roberts, the answer is yes. 
you did educate me about the four corners, and we will try to do our best to uh, follow the regular process. There are obviously sometimes emergency situations where we do an IFR, so I don't want to leave you that we would never ever consider an IFR because I, think, I understand that. But yes. Uh, and uh, I think we are more into the regular order of business, and I appreciate your support. Mr. Chairman, uh, it's not often I give you 50 seconds back. That's true. <laughs> uh, Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the SGR. I was sworn in in February of 1999 to the U.S. House of Representatives. And if I'm correct, every year in December, we had to, at the last minute, patch the SGR or physicians were going down the tubes on reimbursement. And that's still been the case now, and it's 2013. CBO recently gave us a good score or a much lower score on the cost of fixing the SGR. Will you encourage the President, if you're confirmed, and I assume you will be confirmed because you've done a great job, will you encourage the President to adopt that as a priority this year? We have a window of opportunity to do it, and I'd like to see us fix the SGR. Yes, I will certainly uh, work with the President and the President's yeah. team. We agree that SGR needs to be replaced, and we need a permanent solution. Thank you. I think every doctor in America would agree with you as, as yes. well. The Georgia Department of Community Health has a Medicaid waiver application in to allow them to put foster children in, under Georgia's care in a managed care program. As you know, foster kids move around a lot. They go from home to home a lot. They have many times complex medical issues. A managed care type of approach allows them to get away from fee for service, do it all over again when they move locations, and instead have good quality of coordination on their care. I would really work, I work a lot with foster kids and did when I was in the state legislature in Georgia. If you could check on that application and see if you could help expedite or help them expedite what they need to do because foster kids are important people in our state's care and I'd love to see us do that. I can certainly do that. One other question. In the House, we did a piece of legislation probably 10 years ago now on needle sticks. I've been a member of the Diabetes Caucus for a number of years, uh, and I'm aware of the number of complications that come from needle sticks with diabetes. I understand from what I'm told by my staff that you're, you have the flexibility with regard, with regard to diabetes to approve reimbursement for ancillary and related diabetes treatment and services. Needle stick devices, of which there are no, any number available right now, are an excellent way to avoid unwanted needle sticks and further complications and, and, uh, and, other, and other problems. I have a piece of legislation that I've introduced with Senator Coons to try and get CMS to, to approve a reimbursement for needle stick devices, but if you can do it administratively, it would seem to be a big help. And we have a study done by United Healthcare that estimated the savings to those, if they, were, if they had a needle stick destruction device, the savings that would bring to CMS and to United Healthcare because of the number of other ancillary problems it would reduce. Would you look into that for me? I certainly will. And um, that's all my questions. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Isaacs. Senator Casey. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Ms. Tavener, I wanted to commend you for your public service already, the, the work that you've done over a long period of time in a very difficult area of our, of our government and also with, uh, the work you've done in the private sector. I want to commend as well your family. I think the, the applause that uh, we gave to your family earlier today was entirely appropriate but not at all commensurate with the sacrifice that they've made, and um, we're grateful for that. I wanted to focus, um, and I'll try to be brief because I know we have a number of other questioners, on children um, in the context of, of uh, health care and as we implement a very difficult piece of legislation to implement and get it right. Um, those of us who supported it better be committed to getting it right and especially as it relates to children. In our state, we have a little more than 900,000, the last count, uh, about 919,300 children uh, covered by Medicaid, 
about 45 percent of the, the total. Um, and as a lot of the experts uh, tell us about children, when it comes to the, the kind of health care we've got to provide to them, that children, as they, as, as this, these aren't my words, but I try to remember them, children are not small adults. They're, they're different. Their health care needs are different. And you know that from your experience better than I do. I wanted to focus maybe on two or three areas. One would be, um, instead of asking a broad question, because we probably don't have time for that, uh, some of the challenges that will arise when we begin to see the exchanges be implemented. Um, in particular, where uh, kids in the, in the exchanges who normally would get by way of Medicaid or some other way, but mostly by way of Medicaid, so-called wraparound services if they have particularly difficult challenges. Uh, if a child is covered in the exchange in, at some future time, how do you deal with that to make sure that if, a, if the private coverage doesn't meet their needs that there's going to be something comparable to or, or uh, similar to a wraparound service? Can you address that? Uh, yes, sir. Senator Casey, let me start by saying that, and I think you heard this from Senator Kane in the opening comments, um, we are very much committed to helping children in, in the Medicaid program and, and private insurance. And I think we heard that on the oral care, um, dental care. We've done work around with the Strong Start, and I know your state has a project there, and we appreciate your support of that. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done around newborns and infant mortality, around childhood obesity, um, smoking, and, and so we have projects underway inside Medicaid, and I'm happy to brief your staff on that. But it, we are committed to working. What, what we are seeing is that we may have parents in the exchange, children in, in CHIP, and vice versa, and we're working, to treating, working with them as a family unit, and I'm happy to come sit down with your staff and walk through how we'll put those added protections in, because if they're in Medicaid, they obviously are eligible for all of the wraparound benefits and the added protections. Wherever possible, we try to sync up both Medicaid policy and, if you will, the essential health benefits, and we can kind of give you some uh, more detail in that area. That would be great, because of all, with all the changes, um, I just want to make sure we, we meet, um, we meaning myself as well, meet the, the, these obligations. Um, one of the challenges we're facing as well is in some states, like Pennsylvania, uh, we may be f confronting a situation where the state is not part of the exchange uh, and may not uh, embrace the, the changes that re as it relates to Medicaid. So in two major areas of health care implementation, our state may be in a different position than a lot of other states. Um, and I know we will continue to, to talk about this, but um, any suggestions you have or any, um, any insights you have as it, re as it relates to states that are in that position, either not part of the exchange um, or, or not, not part of the Medicaid uh, uh, yes, sir. elements? And, and Senator Casey, for us, and obviously Pennsylvania is one, we're actually meeting with Pennsylvania team today. Um, we are continuing to work with each state on the issue of Medicaid expansion to see if there are um, at least educational pieces we can give them, ways they can look at it, um, clarifying any questions they may have and encouraging Medicaid expansion. In uh, the issue of the exchanges, what we, and you actually have a bit of an advantage 